Thanks, Ed. Uh, no, he lies. It's not winterless. Uh, we have rain, uh, and plenty of it. Um, I'd like to start by saying, Tuatahi ka tika ngā mihi, ki weno ngā haukainga ko te Wurundji, uh, tuatu ki a rātou awa e rere kawana, te Berarange, no rere kamihi kamihi, kami atu ki ngā mate ko Peturangi. Uh, kia tātou e tatu mai, tēnā koutou. Thank you, and thank you for attending this session. Uh, layering people in place. Um, I wasn't really happy with this title uh, coming into the plenary session because it changed it. And I've changed the name of the title now to Intellectual Belonging. Uh, <laughs> um, based on uh, the opening speaker's remarks about open source data and what we do with it, how we serve people, how we serve communities. And Māori Maps is just one example of how we're doing that back home. Um, we're a charitable organisation uh, whose beneficiaries we list as the marae of Aotearoa. Um, there are approximately 779 of them, would you believe? And up until 10 years ago, they had never really been mapped. What is a marae first might be a, a good starting point. We call them the centres of our universe. Um, this one, wrapped in the black cladding of, of darkness, situated in Rotorua. Um, we were lucky enough to have Harry and Megan visit it and welcome on to, onto this marae, Ohini Mutsu. They are today still our centres of social, political uh, gathering. We use them in times of life crisis and we uh, farewell our dead. We formerly used them as our centres of economy. Um, and today, as I say, we've got 779, give or take 10, remaining. But to briefly take you back the layers of marae, finds ourselves in the Pacific. Marae is not a recent phenomenon. And within the wider Pacific, you'll find marae in Tahiti, that one from the left there, uh, is Tapatapuatea and Vaiatea outside of Tahiti. There's others in Rarotonga, uh, other manifestations in Hawaii, some further out in Rapa Nui, uh, all the way into Samoa and Tonga. You've got different uh, iterations of this Pacific, Polynesian, Austronesian culture. Uh, and then that uh, beautiful volcanic cone there is where I'm from. Um, that's a pa. Uh, so 800 years ago, uh, these, these earthwork, or these, these volcanic cones and hills and outcrops were earthworked into uh, fortresses. What are they today? They're places of uh, meeting. Uh, they are, a lot of them have been in the same place for generations. This one here uh, is my one up in the Bay of Islands. Um, this one here is not too far away, about 30 minutes drive in the centre of Northland. Um, they, are pe they are still places where we gather. Uh, they give us a context from which we view the world. Now, I was lucky enough to be a Māori farm boy, uh, half well, a Māori Irish farm boy who lived just down the road from this one uh, up until I was age 18. Um, I stumbled my way through university doing archaeology, which is how I found myself into uh, interested in GIS, geospatial um, understandings. And then in about 2011, I became involved with Māori Maps. What does Māori Maps do? It is a response to an apparent crisis of cross-generational dislocation. The 1920s, 1940s, 1920s, World War II, a lot of our Māori people left these communities because they were experiencing uh, poverty, health issues, social issues. Uh, went overseas, uh, fought in the World Wars, also moved to uh, cities and towns to find uh, labour to support these people overseas. A lot of them never came back. Fast forward 1970s, we have, uh, we have a people who are now living in cities three to five generations that have not had that opportunity to engage with the space of belonging. Uh, this marae up here is in the Hokianga, which is once again in Northland. Everything's Northland, Northland centric for me generally, because that's where I'm from. Uh, and if 
the house itself or the, um, the complex of the marae is in disrepair. It's generally, generally a reflection on the, of the community that surrounds it. A lot of them, a handful probably live within five kilometres of that. Uh, the estate houses on the right are in uh, Kaingaroa Forest, once an economic powerhouse in the central North Island. Uh, now, as you can see, uh, dilapidated. So in 2008, uh, a group of us got together. Actually, I've got the founder of Māori Maps in the, in the room, um, sitting at the back there. Uh, Paul Tapsell, uh, Rere Ata Makiha, uh, and a bunch of crazy uh, individuals, Ike Reti, um, went around to map these things. In Paul's words, they were driving around finding this marae to attend a tangi or to uh, assist with a, a museum exhibition. And they just couldn't find the bloody thing. And the, the lament at that stage was, we no longer have our aunties or our uncles in the back seat or in the passenger seat saying, go down this road, go down that road. And so that was the idea. But it became linked to a broader concern about this dislocation. Yeah, if, if we can't find them as people who are connected to our own communities, how do we possibly expect our young people or our 30 to 50 year olds that have lived away to be able to access these centres of belonging? As you can see, the road trip that we embarked on over a period of 8 to 10 years, I think we finished in 2014, um, was exciting. Uh, the caption to uh, the one across the road was, um, where the hell are we? <laughs> the, the man on the horse was telling us which way to go. Uh, no, you just go there, there. If you get to the turn off with the red mailbox, don't go down that one. That's auntie, she'll throw you the gun at you. <laughs> and we're lucky enough, uh, um, I was lucky enough to join the crew on the, uh, on the road uh, recently and wrapping up the last of our mapping. Once again involved a bit of uh, beautiful vistas, beaches, uh, locals on their horseback, rolling up the shorts, holding the camera above the water, uh, the GPS uh, navman, and the project developed from there. Originally I think the idea was to actually have an atlas or a, a local map where we could actually just put these plots on, but it became something so much more. To the gate. The philosophy behind Māori maps is to bring descendants to the gate. From that point on, we want them to engage with their own people. Now, that brokering that relationship is a difficult space, uh, and it's not one we can actually do from our research offices or from the bush up home. Um, but our philosophy is also represented in where we actually dropped our GPS locators at the gate, uh, and we collected knowledge, very basic, and it's um, yeah, very, very basic knowledge. What is the local mountain of uh, importance? What is the local river of importance? Whatever was available in public sources, uh, that's, that's the information we tried to stick to. And then we made that a bit more robust through communication with the people themselves. Uh, now, I appreciate the last speaker who went for a live demo, so I'm going to attempt to do the same, um, but like all good things. Oh, it seems to have gone off, that's right. Should open in a... Um, while he's getting that on, uh, yeah. we've yeah. got... Oh, cool. Um, we're currently running with the so-called proverbial enemy in the room, I think. Uh, ten years ago, we, we went down this mission with uh, the Google API because it was accessible, because we're a charitable organisation, we, we didn't have the funds then. Uh, it served our purposes for that time being. Um, we're at a tipping point now. Well, we might have to start rethinking what, where we take this. So this is what it looks like currently. It's, um, I've, I've jumped to the map page, because why not? And you can start to see the extent of geospatial work we've got into. I'm going to digitally take you to where I'm from, um, up in this winterless north, 
to a small rural community called Oromahue. Blink you miss kind of place, <coughs> as many of these uh, communities are. Um, the, the phrase to the gate also represents how we interact with um, our communities. Part of our, what we would call intellectual belonging, are these, geo, well, these GPS coordinates. Because no one had done them before um, until we went along and did them. And then the government came knocking on our door saying, hey, you guys have got an amazing site. Can we have your data? So, in the politest possible way, we have to reiterate, actually, we've collected this data not for us. We hold it in trust on behalf of the marae. Um, and that philosophical standpoint is in service, in service and account accountability to them. But what I've come to realise this morning is that our intellectual belonging is also the relationships we've built over the last 10 years with marae. So every week I'll get three to four emails from a marae community saying, hey, love your site, but can you fix this? So this is the basic information I was talking to you about. It is basic, and because we did an investigation of public sources to begin with, it can be wrong. We're not making any pretenses to say, actually, we've got this right. And the dialogue that flows on from that communication has made our site and our service more robust. Um, so to have another organisation like, I think, a month ago, we had the Office of Treaty Settlements knocking at our door saying, I love your site, uh, how can we access your data? We, while respect the initiative, um, have to say, well, once again, we're in service. And if we did give this data away, it would be out of context, because the relationships would have to go with it. Uh, so we, the, the, maintaining those relationships is probably one of the key factors of Māori Maps. I'm going to jump back to my slides. Um, and get to what kind of layers we're representing. Um, these coloured blocks here represent Māori land, uh, the remaining Māori land. And a huge shout out to the Māori Land Court and the Ministry of Justice for making this all open source. Um, so any descendant, any tourist, any visitor, any organisation can find the Māori land blocks, visit it, and it takes you to their website. At the same time, we've got uh, links that take you right to uh, soil quality sites with uh, Manaki Whenua Land Care Research. So a big uh, shout out to them as well. For example, in terms of reconnection, uh, this is uh, one of the owner's uh, land blocks. And you'll see um, multiple amalgamated blocks. If you're a descendant, you can find out the number of owners, thousands. If you have a last name, or aunt, no, an auntie's last name or a grandmother's last name, that's one way you can access uh, into where you're from. Uh, finally, um, where we're taking this. Now, like I said, we're at a tipping point. <coughs> our, tip our tipping point is that um, we've got layers of data that are coming left, right and centre. We've got uh, old historic land maps. We've got uh, census data and we've got um, oops. And we've got PAR sites, and these are all starting to be uh, mapped and layered. Uh, sorry. Like I said, we're, we're, we're starting to question where we are with Google Earth, or Google API. The, the, the services uh, have you know, provided us a useful platform, but in terms of structure, um, we're ready for something else. We operate our CMS on Drupal. Um, we then have the Google API underneath, and then our, in terms of source community, open source data, it's the marae themselves that are actually contributing regularly, maintaining our accountability, maintaining our service. But with that, I'm going to finish up early, well, try to finish up as early as possible. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you to the host organisers for putting on this, this great conference. Thank you also for the supporting the travel grant recipients, me being one of them. Uh, as a poor PhD student, um, it's, it, I couldn't have been here without you guys. And thank you to all of you who are working in the digital geospatial space and doing some crazy stuff that <coughs> excites me to see where we could take this kind of resource. Thank you.